Good morning, church. Welcome to worship, coming to you live from Georgetown United Methodist on Sunday, August 2nd. My name is Sherry Swanson. I'm the pastor here at Gum Church, and I'm so glad you've decided to join us for our online service. The vision of our church is to actively live the example of Jesus. And we welcome all people to participate in the ministries of our church. You are welcome, and we pray that God will bless you as we worship together. This morning, we will be celebrating communion, so I invite you to locate some bread and juice or other common elements for that portion of our service. Thank you to the crew, which is here to assist in our live streaming, Alex Berenger, Ryan Malott, Andy Meredith, and Heather Boazchek. We appreciate your service. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. Rich in things 
kings and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we Search for thy salvation, be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore, serving thee whom we adore. Let us pray. God of grace, God of glory, we are grateful for this day that you have made. We are grateful for this opportunity we have to spend time with you during this hour of worship. Pour out your power upon us now. Give us wisdom. Give us courage as we live this day and each day for you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bailey Williams, and I am the Assistant Director of the Young Disciples Ministry at Georgetown United Methodist Church. Today's story is about Joseph and a very special coat his father gave them. Except today's story is not all about a fancy coat. It's a story about pride and jealousy. Now, pride and jealousy do not always have to be bad things. It's what we do with these emotions that really matters. In the story today, both Joseph and his brothers do not handle pride and jealousy in appropriate ways. I wonder if you have ever wanted to do something bad or have done something bad because of pride or jealousy. During our story today, I would like you to pay attention and think about how Joseph and his brothers could have reacted differently to the situations. Our story for today takes place in Canaan, where Joseph was with his father, Jacob, and 11 of his brothers. Now, it was known to everybody, including his brothers, that Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. In fact, Jacob loved him so much that he got him a very fancy coat. Some say it was fancy because it had a bunch of different colors, and others say it was fancy because it had long sleeves. Both would have been very expensive back in the day. This gift that Jacob gifts Joseph makes his brothers very jealous and hateful towards him. Joseph begins having dreams sent to him from God. One night, he dreams that him and his brothers are all bundles of wheat, and he dreams that the bundles gather around him and bow down to him. Instead of keeping this dream to himself, he explains it to all of his brothers, and his brothers grow even more jealous and hateful towards him. They ask, wondering if he thinks that they will bow down to him one day. Joseph has another dream sent to him one night. He dreams that the sun, moon, and eleven stars gather around him and bow down to him once again. His brothers grumble, growing more jealous and hateful towards him, asking if he expects to be in charge of them one day. Joseph's brother's jealousy grew so intense that they wanted to end his dreams and kill him. One of their brothers, Reuben, begged them not to kill Joseph and instead throw him in a deep well where he could not get out. However, he planned to later help him escape without his brothers knowing. They all agreed and threw Joseph into the well, stripping him of his fancy coat. As they waited outside the well, Ishmaelite traders passed by and they hatched a new plan. They were going to trade Joseph for 20 silver pieces. The traders agreed to this deal and bought Joseph for 20 silver pieces to be a slave in Egypt. Now the brothers, not wanting to tell their father of the horrible thing that they've done, tricked him by dipping Joseph's fancy coat into goat's blood. Their father was immediately tricked and thought that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. He began to mourn, not knowing that Joseph was alive in Egypt. The characters in our story today made bad decisions out of pride and jealousy. Joseph knew that he was his father's favorite child and that he was special to God. 
and instead of being humble about it, he boasted to both his father and brothers, which made them grow jealous and hateful. I wonder what Joseph could have done differently. Maybe he could have expressed to his father that he didn't like the way that he treated him differently because it made his brothers jealous and hateful towards him. Maybe he could have been more helpful towards his brothers and explained his situation and dreams better to them. I wonder how Joseph's brothers could have responded differently as well. They made a bad decision out of jealousy. Maybe they could have told Joseph about the way they were feeling instead and explained that they weren't being treated fairly. I wonder if you have ever wanted to or have done something bad out of jealousy. You should know that everybody gets jealous, including myself. However, it's never okay to hurt others out of jealousy. I wonder what else you could do instead of doing something bad if you're jealous. For me, I like to meditate, exercise, or pray when I get jealous. This helps clear my mind and help me respond differently to a situation that I could respond poorly to. I wonder what you like to do. Don't let jealousy lead you to make bad decisions like Joseph's brothers did. To me from where the thunder rides. I can't outrun this heart I'm tethered to. With every step, I collide with you. Like a tidal wave crashing over me, rushing in to meet me here. Your love. Fears like a hurricane that I can't escape, tearing through the atmosphere. Your love is fierce. You cannot fail. The only thing I found is through it all. You never let me down. You don't hold back. Relentless in pursuit At every turn I come face to face with you Like a tidal wave Crashing over me Rushing in to meet me here Your love is fierce Like a hurricane That I can't escape Tearing through the atmosphere Your love is fierce You chase me down You seek me out How could I be lost When you have called me found chase me down you seek me out how could I be lost when you have called me found you chase me down you seek me out how could I be lost when you have called me found you chase me down you seek me out how could I be lost when you have called me found? Like a tidal wave crashing over me, rushing in to meet me here. Your love is fierce like a hurricane that I can't escape, tearing through the atmosphere. Your love is fierce Your love is fierce Your love is fierce Your love is fierce
Our scripture reading for today comes from the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14a and 18 through 35. I'm reading today from the New Living Translation. So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, So you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, Your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty, there was no water in it. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? His blood would just give us a guilty conscience. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver and the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, the boy is gone, what will I do now? 
Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it is my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning for my son, he would say. And then he would weep. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, teach us today from your word that we may better understand your grace in our lives. Amen. DACA has been in the news this summer. First in June, when the Supreme Court blocked an effort to end the program, and then again this past week due to some pushback from the administration. DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. The program protects young, undocumented immigrants who arrived in this country as children from deportation. These nearly 800,000 young people are often called by another name, DREAMers. That term originally was an acronym created from a legislative proposal called the Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors, D-R-E-A-M, Act. But the name is also descriptive because these individuals dream of a better life in this country. They want to stay here and and grow up and go to school and go to work. Our sermon series for this month is about a dreamer, not an undocumented immigrant in America, but a Hebrew teenager who is taken against his will to the foreign land of Egypt. His name is Joseph, And throughout his fascinating life, he has a series of dreams. And he discovers that he has a gift for interpreting the dreams of others. It's quite likely you know the story of Joseph from the Broadway musical which bears his name, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It's a fantastic show, and if you've never seen it, I would highly recommend it. But this morning, I'd also like to recommend that you read Joseph's story in the Bible. It's easy to read, quite entertaining, and very inspiring. We're starting today with Genesis chapter 37. The story continues in chapters 39 through 50. So I hope you'll read the whole thing. It won't take you very long. When we first meet Joseph, he is 17 years old. He is the 11th of 12 sons born to Jacob, and he is the apple of his father's eye. Now, Jacob, of all people, should well know about the dangers of showing favoritism. You may remember from my sermons back in June when I was preaching on the matriarchs of our faith how Jacob's family of origin was torn apart by favoritism. His mother, Rebecca, favored him, but his father, Isaac, favored his brother, Esau. And the shenanigans which went on in that household caused a rift which lasted for more than 20 years. As the Bible notes in several places, children often pay the price for the sins of their fathers. That is, there are consequences for the mistakes people make. 
And sometimes bad behaviors are passed on from one generation to another. Children grow up and repeat the same patterns that they saw in mom and dad. We think, for example, of how those who have been abused sometimes become abusers themselves. Well, here, instead of learning from the mistakes of his parents, Jacob repeats them. He singles out one child, Joseph, and gives him a favored status in the family. Psychologists who study family systems theory point out how a family becomes dysfunctional when one child gains this status of being the chosen one. Well, Jacob makes it very clear to everyone who has this status in his family. The scripture tells us in verse 3 that Jacob loves Joseph more than all his other children. The reason given here is because Joseph was born to him in his old age. And maybe being around the young child Joseph did give special joy to the old man, Jacob, but quite possibly, this favoritism also has a lot to do with the fact that Joseph was the son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. Yes, Jacob had children with four different women. It kind of sounds like a soap opera, but it was not uncommon at that time. Rachel was the beauty who captured his heart and soul. And her children... Joseph and Benjamin filled a big hole in Jacob's heart after she passed away in childbirth. In our reading for today, Jacob gives his favorite son a special gift, a long, beautiful, colorful robe. The Hebrew words used here are not actually clear to us but they probably describe the style and length of this robe. Meaning, as Bailey said earlier, that it had long sleeves and went down all the way to Joseph's ankles. This was the type of robe worn by royalty. It symbolized a person's position of authority. Now the robe also may have been made out of fabric of several different colors. This is what it says in the Septuagint Bible, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew dating back to the third century BC. This is why when many of us learned this story in Sunday school, we were probably told that it was a coat of many colors. At any rate, these are some special duds that have been showered on Joseph by his doting father, Jacob. Quite possibly, the gift of this robe was a signal that Jacob intended to designate Joseph as his heir. At any rate, when Joseph puts on this garment, it certainly makes him stand out in the crowd. And seeing him sport this attire causes his brothers to burn with jealousy and resentment. Then on top of this, it doesn't help that Joseph starts having these dreams. Dreams in which he is always in the starring role and his brothers are circling around him and bowing down before him. Now, Joseph isn't making up these dreams. He really does have them. And later in the month, we'll see how these dreams come to fruition. But still... Joseph could have chosen to keep the dreams to himself. Or at least he could have exhibited a little more tact in how he chooses to speak about them. Instead, we get the sense that he kind of relishes shooting off his mouth, bragging to his brothers, and agitating them with his notions of grandiosity. He seems a bit spoiled and full of himself. He even runs to tattle to his father whenever he sees his brothers doing something wrong. One would think that Jacob may have noticed the bad blood brewing between his sons, but instead he seems rather oblivious. 
And so he sends his younger son Joseph to go check on the older boys who are out tending the sheep. They see him coming, and a plot begins to take shape. Let's get rid of this smart aleck once and for all, they think. Their hearts are filled with anger and murderous thoughts. Yes, they literally discuss killing him right then and there. This seems kind of extreme. But don't forget, we encounter similar animosity between brothers earlier in the book of Genesis. Cain kills his brother, Abel. And Joseph's uncle, Esau, threatens to kill his father, Jacob. Well, two of Joseph's older brothers seem uncomfortable with murdering him, and they suggest alternatives. Reuben's idea is for them to just leave him in a pit to die without actually laying a hand on him themselves. We're told that this is a ruse, and Reuben secretly plans to come back and rescue Joseph later. Judah has another idea. He proposes they sell Joseph to some Ishmaelite slave traders. Because, in verse 26, he says that if they kill him, they will have a guilty conscience. I'm not quite sure how you can avoid having a guilty conscience about selling your brother into slavery, but people are able to justify all kinds of behaviors. And so this is what they do. They betray Joseph for 20 pieces of silver a reference which reminds us of the 30 pieces of silver Judas received when he betrayed Jesus. Clearly, the brothers never expect to see Joseph again. Good riddance appears to be their attitude. But they do have a problem. They have to go back and explain things to their father, Jacob. They decide to trick him by dipping Joseph's beautiful robe in some animal blood to show that he's been killed. This plot is very ironic because you may remember that Jacob was himself a trickster who dressed up in animal skins to trick his own father, Isaac, into giving him the final blessing intended for his brother, Esau. Again, the sins of the father come home to roost. Yet, it's hard not to feel some sympathy for poor Jacob. At hearing this news about the death of his son, he is absolutely devastated, completely broken-hearted. He weeps inconsolably, and proclaims that he will mourn for the rest of his life. This whole family is completely broken. Their lives are shattered. What can we learn from their story? Well, many of us come from broken families. Often that phrase is used with regard to divorce, but families can be broken in many other ways. Some, like Joseph's, are broken by jealousy and anger and bitterness. This past week, I read an obituary for Olivia de Havilland, the actress who played Melanie Wilkes in the classic movie Gone with the Wind. She died at the age of 104. I was struck by a little note about the relationship she had with her sister, another actress named Joan Fontaine. Apparently, the competition between these two was fierce. According to some accounts, their sibling rivalry was rooted in the favoritism their mother showed toward her older daughter, Olivia. In 1941, the two sisters were both nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actress. Joan took home the Oscar that year. Supposedly, after that, 
They rarely spoke to one another. That's sad, isn't it? But you know, it's not particularly uncommon. In the course of my ministry, I have officiated at several weddings and several funerals where family members were estranged. Siblings would not talk to one another. Sometimes they weren't even invited to attend. There's a lot of brokenness in our world today, and much of it stems from the brokenness we experience in our families. Those hurts can go so deep, and the wounds can stay with us for a very long time. Maybe you feel like your parents favored one of your siblings, and that has hurt you deeply. Or maybe you enjoy the chosen status in your family, but that comes with its own emotional baggage. The need to be perfect, the desire to please the folks at all costs, the separation from your brothers and sisters. And it's not only nuclear families that are broken, our entire human family experiences so much brokenness. There are divisions between black and white, rich and poor, gay and straight, male and female. But we're all brothers and sisters, and we know that God loves all God's children with a love that is steadfast and unconditional. So whenever we feel hurt and disappointment and even betrayal in our human relationships, we can hold on to this constant, consistent, never-ending love of our God. Today, we will receive a symbol of that love as we receive communion. At the Lord's table, we witness brokenness, bread broken for us, Jesus' body broken for the whole world. And yet it is through this brokenness that we receive mercy and grace and healing. In the song Anthem, composer Leonard Cohen writes these words, Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. End quote. Friends, all of us are flawed. Our offerings are not perfect. We all experience struggles. We are all broken in some way. And some of the cracks in our lives are very painful. Yet God doesn't give up on us. God meets us in our wounded places. God shines light into our dark places. God restores relationships that have been shattered. God takes our worst days and promises better days. This first chapter of Joseph's story does not bode well for him. He's having dreams, but he's surely not living the dream because he's despised by his own brothers and he's on his way to slavery in Egypt. Without giving away the ending to Joseph's story, let me just say, this is not the final chapter. If you find yourself in a difficult place today, estranged from family, enslaved by some destructive behavior, suffering in some pit, please hear the good news. This is not the final chapter of your life either. God stands ready to lift you out of the pit, to heal your hurts, 
and to give you a future with hope. Thanks be to God for grace which meets us in our brokenness. Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, we are broken people living broken lives. Our families are broken. Our dreams are broken. And yet you remind us that your grace is ever-present and it is enough for us. Your grace pours in through the cracks and crevices, filling us, lifting us, and inviting us to start anew. Oh God, we acknowledge that this life is challenging. The path is not always straight. Sometimes the road is bumpy. We all experience struggles. And some of us suffer like Joseph did. We pray today for families pulled apart by jealousy and bitterness, for relationships that are estranged. We pray for those who have been wounded and betrayed by those close to them. Oh God, bring healing and reconciliation as only you can do. We pray for those who are enslaved physically, emotionally, and spiritually. God, give freedom to those who are held captive. We pray for those who are lonely and hurting and grieving. We pray for immigrants who dare to dream of a better life. And we pray for activists who dare to dream of a beloved community that fully includes all people. Within our community of faith, we pray for Tom, who is recovering from surgery on his thumb, for Karen's friend, who experienced complications from a recent surgery and is going to be removed from life support at the young age of 34. And we pray for his wife and two young children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We celebrate today the baptism of Easton Cash McCarty, the great-grandson of Barney and Pat Oldfield, Bless him and bless his parents, Paul and Kristen, as they nurture him in the faith. We pray for the primary election this week. Give us wisdom, God, as we choose persons to lead our community and state in the days ahead. Bless those who are working at the polls Keep them and all those who are voting in person safe. We pray also that things may go smoothly with the mailing and processing of absentee ballots. Thank you, God, for this precious freedom we enjoy, the opportunity to vote our conscience. May we take seriously this right and responsibility. Thank you, God, for covering each of us with your faithful love. Open our eyes to recognize your leading in our lives. Open our ears to hear your gentle whispers of hope. And then give us courage to step out in faith as we follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
On the night before he died, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to God, broke the bread. Gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body given for you. As you eat this, remember me. Then when the supper was over, Jesus lifted a cup. Again, he gave thanks to God and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and all people for the forgiveness of your sins. As you drink this, remember me. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to your table broken in need of your great mercy. There are so many cracks in our lives. Remind us that this is where your light gets in. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for your generous grace. Pour out now your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts, the grain of the field and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together that prayer which Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christ is with us in this holy meal. In this bread, there is healing. I invite you to break off a piece of your bread now and feast on God's love. In this cup, there's life forever. Taste this now and receive God's forgiveness. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for feeding us in this holy sacrament. Send us out now in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Good morning, church. I'm going to be sharing a few announcements with you this morning. If you are new to worshiping with us online, we would like to get to know you better and keep you up to date with all that is happening at GUM. Head to our website, gumonline.org, click the I'm new tab, the next step button, and you can fill out the form there. There are three ways to give offerings to our church. You may mail them to the church, contribute on our website under the Give tab, or use our mobile app, Give Plus. You can download the app, search Georgetown UMC, or search Churches Close to You. It will walk you through the process step by step and is very simple to use. The next Gumballers softball game will be Thursday, August 6th at 6.30 p.m at Hughes Park on field number one. Come out and support the team. The next food truck will be August 14th at 6 p.m. We are still in need of volunteers and you can contact Amy Schuling if you're interested in helping. Pastor Sherry will offer another coffee with the pastor on August 22nd at 10 a.m. in person outside the church building. You can meet on the 28th Street side near the office door. Bring your own chair and beverage if you'd like. Thank you, and have a great week. Friends, we've been nourished at the Lord's table, and we've experienced God's bountiful grace in our brokenness. So go now into this day with gratitude and praise, and may the Lord bless you with peace. Amen. <laughs>